Good evening. Yad eh, shik eh do, shidene eh, shie hemorrhoid, shie Jennifer hemorrhoid kinesha, as a thane nishle, twitch eatni bashish chin, twitch unja to shiche not adene and dashinella. Hello, my name is Jennifer Himmelreich. Um, I am Mini Goats born for Bitterwater Clan, and I'm from, um, and I thank uh, the, the museum and Brown community for inviting me to speak this evening, and um, I appreciate that. Before I go any further, um, I wish to acknowledge the ancestral traditional lands of the Narragansett, Niantic, Nipmuc, Pequot, and Wampanoag people. Um, whose lands I'm living on and whose communities I'm currently, um, I hope to work with more with um, during my time here. So I am from Baclapato, New Mexico, which is, sits right on the um, New Mexico, Arizona state line um, in the Four Corners area of the Navajo Nation. Um, it's a small community where I'm either related by blood or marriage to most community members. I spent most of my time with my Che, my maternal grandfather, Willie Weaver, who was um, a Hatkatli, a singer, uh, a medicine man. Um, he, he would often, I would often go with him in the back of his truck and uh, follow him around. I was, I was a little shadow. And as a Hatkatli, he was a person who helped heal people who were ill. He would sing them back into balance. Um, he would go to local chapter meetings, um, local meetings at the chapter house and post office, trading posts, and I l grew up watching him lead conversations um, with our community members, always constantly trying to figure out who we were and how we fit, um, how we, our traditional community values fit in the larger world. So he taught me our, our cultural stories, our emergent stories. Um, and it's a story taught our, by our cultural leaders in the right seasons. And it begins with our emergence in the previous underworlds into this, which is the fourth world. In the first world, um, the first beings grew out of an inky black unconsciousness. Conflict and strife eventually forced the first beings to ascend into the next world, which is blue, then yellow, where they each encounter in each level, each world they encounter animal, insect, and masked spirit beings that they befriend, learn from, and bring with them into each, into each new world. So the stories of these beings tells, tell of our ancestors' struggle to overcome disharmony and contention, always making a home in new lands while continuing the essence of our culture while acknowledging the new beings that we had encountered and always integrating what they taught us and always, always trying to stay ahead of the coyote. This is sort of who I am and how I, my viewpoint of how I view the world. So this, all of that has shaped the glittering world of what we call the fourth world and where we live now. Um, and these stories that we grew up with continue to be depicted through um, Navajo ceremonies, songs, and through us storytellers. For me, as I grew up with these lessons and moved forward, um, I studied art and sociology at Fort Lewis College. My senior year after a summer studying actually at um, the Harvard's Graduate School of Design, studying architectural design, um, I began to think of I had, I had never thought of space, of how um, there could be intentional space within communities. And I began to look at how tribal communities were creating intentional spaces where they wanted to preserve and continue the stories that they came from. And so I created a, um, an independent study course where I visited uh, tribal communities and, and institutions with, around the Southwest, trying to understand um, more about what the intentions for each space was and whether these intentions were realized in, these, um, in their institutions. I took a position with the Auction Indian Community, which is south of Phoenix, um, where I was an exhibit technician at their Himdok Echo Museum and Archives. Um, this museum is built on an alternative museum model focused on the identity of a place, where the museum isn't just a building 
but encompass the land surrounding it, um, where communities are both the curator and the public, and where the collections are in their home, not in the museum. This was my museology understanding. This is where I came from. And I loved the work. I loved being what I understood at that time as a cultivator of conversations. Um, I, and extending preservation and cultural knowledge beyond building walls and, and uh, collections policies to enco always encompass the wider context of auctions, political and economic spheres. Um, and, and our institution served as not only an educational place, but as a storehouse for historic preservations, as a meeting place where community members could voice what was going on, um, to learn about past, present, and future. Uh, and you know, the whole goal of that institution was a space where they could talk about themselves and understand themselves first. Educating the public at that time when I was there was not the focus of it. And this really informed me moving forward. It began, it was sort of the way that I saw um, how I thought muse museums should run, and it was really my first introduction into it. But soon I returned back to Baclopato and began what I call my second um, education in culture and community, taught by the one person that could teach me, my masana, my maternal grandmother. My maternal grandmother at that time um, was just, w was we had had a house together, and she was the daughter and the wife of um, a medicine man. Um, and she was a weaver. And she was steeped in everything um, Navajo. And she only spoke Navajo. And so I came home and really began learning what it takes to be a community member. And this is something I think as tribal and community members that sometimes we forget as we move through this educational Western education system is we sometimes lose touch with our communities. And moving home, my grandmother was the one who taught me that when somebody comes, you immediately put on a pot of coffee and you get, you make a, a vada dough and you warm some food up and you welcome people into the home. And I also learned about how the foods that we had, we built gardens, we did these things that, for me, as I started to have my kids, we, I had my two girls, we built gardens around our house, raised garden beds, we um, planted uh, fruit trees, we grabbed chickens and sheep, and we were trying to create a system and, and a life for my grandmother who, um, when I moved home, there was eight of, there was only eight maternal grandmothers left. These are the ladies that sort of ruled all of our community meetings. There was only eight of them left at that time, and over the course of um, our 10 years at home, they slowly started passing away. And so I began recording them and learning from them, asking them um, what they called things, um, how they ate it, how they prepared it. And never going home ever, ever saying, um, this is how you should do things, because I've got a degree I'm more educated than you. That that would never um, work in my community. I just started doing, building the gardens, um, going to the classes, and, and doing things in which my community could see why could see um, might be useful to them. I started, um, you know, I had vegetables and I had bumper crops. Started selling it. Had tons and tons of eggs, and so I think for them. What I began to understand was that for my community, for my tribal community, they didn't want to be told how to live, especially from somebody who was educated. They wanted to be told, wanted to be shown it. Um, I had assumed moving home that I just sort of had a, you're a community member, you're accepted card. What I learned pretty quickly was I didn't. Um, it wasn't until about my third or fourth year, somebody had told me, oh, so you really are here to stay. Because our tribal community members, we, we pour money into them. We do all these things. And then they come home for a year. And when, when the change can't happen, 
they turn around and run away. We see it with, with the programs, Teach for America, these sorts of things where people come in, drop in for a moment, and realize it is so dysfunctional, it is so hard, there's so many things to overcome that they'd turn around and walk away. And for me, this really was a lesson of what, um, the, the, how I needed to approach the work that I wanted to do. Um, so, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, in these lessons that I was getting through gardening, through working with animals, I was really beginning to understand there, there had to be deeper ties to the community and how I was looking at things. So I started my master's program and really began thinking about knowledge um, and how knowledge was different in a Western world versus an indigenous worldview. So in a Western point of view, there's, um, the, the systems are built upon the written word. Um, it's the most trustworthy sources of knowledge are information acquired by the senses um, and verified by logical, scientific, scientific and mathematical testing. Knowledge that does not come this way is regarded with a great deal of suspicion. There's a, and, and there's a strategic dispowerment of anyone who says anything different from that way of thinking. Um, and in this system, um, and how to, and how does that happen? Um, Adara Hoppers sums it up quickly that in this system, a professional class of intellectuals serves as the structures of organized domination by assessing, labeling, naming, and constructing knowledge and reality. And this is um, a lot of what influenced my my um, work was reading a lot of um, Edward Said, who talked about um, how in order to dominate a land, um, you first take over, rename things, you, re you map and you rename things, and you create systems based on the systems from which you come from, outsiders are coming from, and they slowly disempower those that were there before them. So for indigenous folks, um, a lot of what we believe is, is, is based on metaphysical beliefs. Since time immemorial, stories have been our means of passing down our values and cultures from generation to generation, fully intact. Um, I think sometimes um, a lot of what's happened is that for tribal communities, or for outsiders who look at, come into tribal communities, they sort of see it as, um, because they don't have this written word, this sort of value that um, for, for them, for us, there's things in which stories that have been told that have been told the same over and over generation. It's holistic. Um, we, we recognize that interconnected with the natural and spirit worlds, that, that there's a lot of different ways that one can learn about the world and our place within it. Um, and so oral traditions and histories are absolutely essential. That, um, and that knowledge is seen as much more subjective, and in some communities it may not be as prescriptive about how they go about acquiring it. So the richness of the indigenous knowledge um, let's see, lies in the recognition that there are diverse versions of existence diverse ways of being in the natural world, and so diverse experiences to appreciate and respect. And so I think that this, as I was starting my master's degree in library and information science, I, I, I was very, I could see sort of where, what I was living at and at home and gaining from my tribal community and my grandmother was going right up against, uh, sorry, was going right up against what um, I was learning in a master's program about how to organize and classify and break apart these things to me in which belong together there was it was without context everything was without context and i had gotten my museology museology training at an institution where context was always key um, and so i really wanted to um, begin to study that a little bit more my um, 
I think my first semester I started, uh, I had to write a research paper, and it was about, I, I came across these digital projects, um, these indigenous digital projects, and this was about maybe five years ago, and they were just sort of piecing them in, and I was hearing about some communities that were building it a little bit over here and a little bit over there, and, and really started, as I was looking through it, I began to see, based on, of course, being home in the community, understanding their needs, I could see why some were successful and some weren't. And I began creating and, and wrote a paper based on this like beginning idea of these promising virtual practices of, around new media and in, um, technology. And I was a technophobe when I entered into this. Um, I didn't really quite understand it. Um, and I only really got into it because of my degree, which was fully online. And, and the program that I was under helped create um, a, a complex community so I could work on this online program from home. And what I understood in that was that it was exciting, it was neat. And, and I countered that with, I had come home believing that tribal communities were, um, were that we didn't have the resources, that the communities that we were really without resources. But when I went home and I was a part of this, um, my daughter's preschool at the local school, um, there was a, these, these young parents who were surrounding me, they all had iPads and they all had smartphones. And I, I, didn't, I didn't even have a smartphone at the time. I didn't have an iPad. And I really, for me, was... I, it was something, it was a revelation. And when I asked them, just in conversation, hi, you know, what, so what do you use that for? And they said it was to play games and to get on Facebook, which at the time I wasn't on. And so for me, I, I, it was an interesting sort of conversation. I said, well, have you ever used it to access online resources? To, you know, when you, to get to a library, to look at museums collections, and they, it, it was not even on their radar. I had asked when, when you go to, because we, you know, we, we live up in the Four Corners area, when you go to Albuquerque, when you go to Phoenix, do you use it to get you around, to utilize it? And they weren't at all. This was, so there was a big sort of disparity in sort of these amazing projects that I was seeing these museums, libraries, and archives creating, supposedly to connect to the communities they wanted to, yet the communities had no sense that these things existed. Um, and I wanted to know how some communities were making that jump and how they were doing it. So I began to study what I termed new media. Um, and so I define new media as um, content available on demand through the internet, basically web 2.0. It's accessible on any digital device, usually containing a user feedback and creative participation element. So these are multiple examples of Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Google, all these sorts of different um, platforms in which community can be created. Um, and they can also include online newspapers now with a commentary section, wikis, video games, you know, all, all these sort of um, different things. And there's there's some defining characteristics of new media. Um, one is that it creates dialogue. There's, um, there's an opportunity for people to chant, to talk. It um, transmit con transmits contact through connection and conversation, enables people from around the world to share, comment, and discuss a wide variety of topics. It's interactive. People are connecting in a lot of different ways in multiple ways. Um, and most interestingly, I thought, and as I got to study it a little bit more, because again, I came into this later, it was sort of like an um, anthropologist looking at this new horizon of, all right, what is this thing that everybody was on? I was, the, I think, the last person on Facebook. Um, but I thought they offered us this interesting ability to tell stories. Um, We've probably heard of the term something go viral. And what used to be shared one to one, face to face, now can be shared one to a thousand, depending on a person's network. 
So this idea for me, I could see why the, the, the young parents in my parent group were so drawn to it in a, in a community without resources. Um, and they were just sort of struggling to figure things out. What, what social media, what Web 2.0 was giving them was an opportunity to share their experience with the world. And to me, that was fascinating. So I began through this work, um, and as I presented, more people began coming to me saying, this is really interesting. How do we, how do we um, bring it, let other people know um, about it? And I began working with um, outside communities. I, I, I worked with, um, the, I got to the Anne Ray internship at the School of Advanced Research, and they were beginning to work on, prior to me doing the internship, they had asked me to be work on their collaborative guidelines. Um, and it was this idea that what, what do institutions and communities need if they want to access a museum's collections? How do you maximize that point of access? Because there was lots of stories that we were hearing of tribal communities that had gone to an institution um, about what they, what they were wanted to get out of the inst this meeting and this visit and what the institution was wanting to get out of this visit. And it was very clear there wasn't a lot of discussion um, and, and about the expectations on both sides. Uh, and so what we did was we created these, so we were, I was a part of this large group of people that created these collaborative guidelines where we went in and we created one guideline for the community and really broke down what it is to go to an institution like a museum because some of these folks visiting from tribal communities weren't museum professionals or library or archives professionals. Sometimes they were folks who were artists, sometimes they were cultural bearers, cultural council members, um, who were going in to see the items. And then, you know, on institutions' ends, they weren't telling them that there was possibly bodies in the collection spaces. So there was a lot of sort of non-communication and what we wanted to do was to create two documents, one for the community to prep them and prepare them for what to expect, but also now, and the second document is out now, um, one for institutions to explain sort of the mindset that tribal communities were going into, and really to create a set of questions on both sides so that they could go into it. And again, this is all informing the work that you know, I always tell people 80% of my job is managing expectations, is sort of learning what people need to know to get the most out of an experience. So StoryCorps came to me and asked me, how do I work, how do we work with tribal communities? And I went through and basically told them this is how you need to be upfront about why you're going in there. You need to talk with them, you need to, you know, we, you need to refine the process of how you go in and extract from a community. And it's what you have as a product. Don't, don't kid yourself about that. It's not some generous thing that you're doing. You're going in and you're taking stories from the community. And we, we live in a culture of colonialism, right? First, our land was taken. And then our material culture was taken and put in these... In, in museum collections far away from the lands and the context that they come from. Then generations were taken, women and children. And sort of the last thing that we have left is our stories and our knowledge. And for institutions now and libraries, archives and museums to come in and sort of expect tribal communities to just give it freely is not anybody, researchers, academics, anybody to go into these tribal communities is you're going to find a fight now. You're going to, you're going to go in there and they're going to want to know why. Why should we tell you anything? What did it, how did it benefit us before? And so when History Pen came to me and said, we'd like to work with tribal communities to do these digital projects, how can how can History Pen work with tribal communities? For me, I, I had to halt the process and say, okay, 
I like the idea and I, I'd love to work with you, but that's not the question we need to be asking. The question we need to be asking is what do tribal communities need before they work with you? That's what we need to know. That's what, in order, with you, StoryCorps, anybody, it just needs to be, without side entities, what do tribal communities need to be empowered? And so um, they, the, the, um, the strategic projects director, John Voss, and I worked together, and he wanted to, had gotten a grant to work with a group of tribal, New Mexico tribal librarians and a group in California. And what we did is I created a methodology in which we went in there to, um, to talk to tribal communities, to ask them to figure this out. So the, the goal was really to just sort of, to create something for me that in, in um, a report in which tribal com communities could use it to begin to advocate for their needs. So I created this methodology based on sort of, um, of, of trying to sort of, it's really a listening session. That's how we came into it. Um, and it was, it utilized sort of design thinking. It covered um, key topics employing a user driven research model. So the part one is in our methodology, it was an all day workshop. We, we built a space of trust um, in. I think organizations who want to work with tribal communities have to be aware of that long history of colonization of these things. And anybody who wants to work with a tribal community, you have to understand that, that you're an outsider and there's a, and their community members. That's really what it breaks down to. You're either community or you're not a community member. That's it. Um, and that in this sort of building this space of trust, we, we had all participants, um, especially those that, uh, the outsiders, the non-community members, me included, we, we gave our background, including the all-important question of like, where do you come from? When somebody in tribal community asks, where do you come from? They're not asking, oh, well, I live in Providence, Rhode Island. They want to know like, who claims you? Who's, wh what community, where did your mom and dad come from? How did you, where's the essence of who you are? And so I had the, the, the team introduce themselves, talk about where they came from, sort of, and to, to be honest and tell what their motivations were for coming in here and sort of establishing these things. Again, these expectations, this is why we're here. Out of this conversation, you can, you can expect that we are going to create a report, you'll get to see the report, these sorts of things where they knew what, what to expect. Then we had them tell their story, how they got to the job that they, th they're doing. And for this, I really wanted our, our, the non-community members, these outside folks, to understand what they were working with, with the tribal communities, these librarians. Some of them had degrees, some of them had just sort of fallen into the job, but they needed to understand sort of the terrain they were entering into. The second part of the day was uh, of the workshop was sort of naming the tech. We, once we had created this space of trust, we wanted to um, we wanted to find out what tech they used, and we sort of began an assessment of how they viewed knowledge and information within their communities, whether there were community protocols and policies surrounding it, um, and whether they had, what the infrastructure was like. After a quick lunch, we did a, a quick design process and we began to map their project management. How did, they, how did they conceive of projects and implement it and shape it um, within their communities? And I had sort of theorized again on these promising virtual practices of what I thought would happen. And it was interesting because where I thought the sort of community council check-in where you would go in to make sure everything was okay with the community council. I had put it like way ahead at the very top. And, and they, as tribal librarians, as people who knew their communities, were coming in saying, no, actually we would do it right here. And this is how we would build the argument with our councils. And I, it was, they were very amazing sharing their process um, and I had them cover, like, show me one project, show me the scope, the intended audience, 
Who are your stakeholders? What was the funding history? Do you evaluate, do you assess? And then again, the tribal government and the community approval process. And then the final part was sort of affirming their voices and reflecting back the major themes and challenges that they had said. So in terms of what we, we found, um, we, there were some reoccurring themes between the two groups. One was that they were very low tech in terms of what they had out in the communities. They didn't have a lot. Um, but the, and it wasn't due to principles, but more of lack of resources. They didn't, just, they didn't have the money to get the things that they wanted to. Um, they didn't have, a lot of them didn't have digital protocols or policies surrounding the knowledge about what they did. Um, but it was interesting as we began to, because we assessed social media, all of them across the board, whether their communities were incredibly closed and, and siloed and they didn't share their information with anybody, um, all of them were on Facebook, without a doubt. And I told anybody, I tell anybody who wants to work with tribal communities, you have to be on Facebook. This is where we're at. This is where we're active. Um, and that, well, it was low tech, it was Facebook friendly. And sort of how they were, they were aware of potential issues within content management system, databases. They didn't quite extend that to Facebook, which is its own proprietary monster. They were actively engaged in doing it without sort of, somehow Facebook has overcome it all. And so they were using it to connect. And for them, they viewed it as essential to the, the population that they served. Um, and then they were starting to see older populations log on. And, and it's reflective of sort of Facebook numbers from July 2015 to December 2015. Um, 8.6 million users joined Facebook between the ages of 50 to 65. So it's showing that, that this is a huge growth within a short period of time. And, and it, the first thing most people think of and younger people think of is that why, like, they're not even on there anymore. They're on Snapchat. They've moved on to newer and better things. But for the, these tribal librarians back in the home communities, they said, this is where we're at. I've heard the same thing in Alaskan communities. And I know for a Navajo community out where we're at, we connect through the radio at noon. There's a, a radio station that plays um, music and does announcements all day. But at noon, there's like a announcement time. This is where we announce everything from revivals to school, cakewalks, to deaths and these sorts of things. And this was reflective of um, the same thing up in Alaska, that they, you were either on the radio or Facebook. And so that was really interesting. And right now, there's no real research on that. There's nothing that shows how um, prevalent it is within tribal communities. But there was also real clear um, uh, response from, the, from our participants that there was an awareness that they were being unofficially watched by their communities. So that while they, everybody was on it, they couldn't just post things like knowledge about their community because somebody had said the example of they posted a map and it was something that they had put up in their library and that the community within like an hour or 45 minutes, they got a call back and they said, you need to pull that down immediately. And so there's, they were still like understood that there was they were being watched in some level with it. Um, they talked a lot about and expressed um, how tech was there. There were their worry with tech was um, and sort of their hope with tech was focus, focused on access and authority. They wanted controlled access to it. They wanted designated access levels, especially from communities that had siloed information, knowledge systems within their community. Um, and they wanted to be able to assure their stakeholders that anything that they engaged in had these different silos, these differentiated access levels. Um, that they, what they worried about was sort of this idea of authority that, um, you know, that 
communities understood and a lot of the communities they understood um, authority through governance that, that, that they could see how it was regulated through their tribal council and also their community, their cultural um, councils. But that what Web 2.0, what was really particularly scary about it was that it blurred it, um, the idea of authority. Who's, because I mean, again, we can tell our story. We, we have these, we have a platform to share our, our innermost thoughts. And they were saying we're, we're, what we're seeing on Facebook sort of scares us because we wouldn't share these things um, where communication is truncated, authorities decentralized, and where sharing is everything. And we're starting to see that if public communities who, and, I, and I'm most connected to public communities, um, I, I watch and see a lot of that on my Facebook feeds. Um, but sometimes I see um, dances that I never, I never would have thought would be posted that are posted now. And, and you can see on there their struggle as a community to sort of regulate it. Um, but we, you know, we have a whole generation of young folks who are growing up with this idea that share, the share button is everything, the, getting the number of likes, the sort of thing. And the community, the librarians were, were aware that they needed to be involved somewhere in the process of that. Um, they, um, the, and they also wanted an opportunity. They, they realized that if they became more engaged in tech, that possibly they could restructure authority in terms of outside community, non-community members. That the idea when somebody Googles Navajo, what is Navajo? that if a community had a page up or something, that they possibly could be the first answer that came up instead of something else um, more damaging. So uh, they, were, they wanted to create a more trustworthy um, source of information. Some of them wanted to. Um, in all of them, they wanted to, for, for, all, for most of the participants, what they wanted to do with tech was they wanted to lead with community values. So they wanted, um, and, and we, we sort of found that out and, and we dug into that by, in sort of our questions, they were very rhetorical in nature. We, you know, we never offered solutions. We just sort of asked around and questioned um, of how best to implement projects in these communities. And I didn't ever demand an answer from them. I just asked them and left them so that they could go back into their communities and figure out the solutions themselves um, with those that, 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 that were part of their decision-making process. But it was clear that they were beginning to think of who they were, these community values which they were figuring out in a physical realm. And for our communities in New Mexico who, whose um, knowledge systems were pretty intact and strong, they, they were beginning to think about, well, who are we? we? We know who we are in a physical realm. What does it mean to be native in a digital realm? And how do we translate those values online? Um, for our California groups, it was an interesting sort of conversation of them sort of reclaiming knowledge to sort of piece together their culture and, and take back and they were sort of thinking about it of how do we, um, there, was, there was a variety of answers, but some of them were about how do we, um, how do we revitalize it? How do we take it back? And how do we sort of assert ourselves on the national stage so people know who we are, that we still exist? Um, so it was an interesting sort of how they, they valued or how they talked about it that was interesting. What I was thrilled to see very clearly that they saw tech not as a solution, but as just a tool. A lot of them said, we want, we understand for the kids, the, the iPads will draw them in, but it's not going to be what we actually use to teach culture, that we want to use it to just draw them through the door, and then we want to um, be able to teach a song and do different things there. And they, they, I was glad that they could see that. Um, and they, in New Mexico, they also saw it as a, a way to work with their councils and community members to think about um, how to use tech better. 
again, this idea of who are we as Native people in a virtual realm. That's, they, they were excited about, um, they were beginning to see it in their spaces as a way to talk about that. As we close out our session, um, we, we, had, we encountered um, an unplanned for, unexpected, um, but exciting outcome. At the end, participants in both groups expressed an, like an, increase, an increased sense of confidence. They said that they felt empowered and advocated for themselves strongly for more tools to help guide their communities and how to talk about tech with their communities and to outside agencies, possible funding agencies. Um, and they wanted more. And it wasn't something I went in and did these sessions with that goal, but it was amazing to see them realize that in talking about working together, listening to each other, watching each other, talk about their project management process, um, listen how they were creating solutions, how they were getting at it. They were leaving it more empowered than ever. Um, and with one of the groups, New Mexico, there was some funding there to actually implement and start projects. And they've actually, the group of librarians has created um, a video, an oral history, and that they're using to advocate for libraries New Mexico tribal libraries. And it was an opportunity for them to learn the tech and the tools using a really benign subject matter that they could go in and say, all right, now, and go to their tribal councils and say, this is what we've done. This is the tech that we use. This is how we're going to do it. And so they could go in more informed um, and create the projects that they felt like reflected their values. So that was, um, I felt like it was a shift from a reactive responses, what I feel like that they were struggling with in terms of tech was very reactive, into something very proactive. And I think that's what was the key in terms of making them feel like they were the people who could create change in their communities. So, you know, I can't do any of this without thinking about sort of you know, if, if the pendulum swings to tech and, and hey, yay, it's so great and wonderful, what's the other side of that? And so um, I, I lean a lot on Neil Postman. And Neil Postman, um, he, he's this great, you know, great person who, who really is very thoughtful on the impacts of technology on cultures. Um, and he wrote this amazing book called Technopoly. Um, and he argues in that book that today's culture, two thought worlds exist simultaneously, the technological and the traditional. And he says in there that uh, with the rise of technology, one of these thought worlds disappears. Technopoly el eliminates alternatives to itself. It does not make them illegal, immoral, or even unpopular. It makes them invisible and therefore irrelevant. So he, to add to that argument, he states that uh, new technology doesn't add or subtract something. It changes everything. So in the year 1550 years after the printing press had been created, there wasn't an old Europe plus a printing press. We had a completely different Europe. And I think this, for at the heart of it, is what tribal communities and their councils and the, those that are really fighting to maintain that culture are fearful, fearful of that there'll no longer be an old tribe plus digital projects, that they may be a completely different tribe. Um, and it's that argument's a game changer, right? That, that you, we have to really think about letting this into our communities. But most tribes that I know are at a, at a point of, of um, crisis in terms of language and um, cultural heritage, that their um, a 2012 NPR segment counted something, some 7,000 spoken languages in the world, and that linguists project that as many as half may disappear by the end of the century. And this is something that our, our language and our cultural heritage has been under attack since the founding of the United States, that, um, and that now on top of everything, on top of trying to fight the systems in place, that have suppressed our knowledge, that we also, tech is very enticing. 
that I don't know any kid that can't figure out an iPad like right away. There's something into that. It's very intuitive in which we as tribal communities are trying to figure out how to, um, we're competing with it and how do we use it to um, the best of our ability. But what, what gives me hope is that these tribal librarians who work and who are embedded in their communities, who are already doing digital projects, already see it as a tool and not as a solution. And I think that's sort of Postman's, um, they're already almost fighting against Postman's belief that it's gonna change them co completely. Um, and I think that, you know, and Postman speaks a lot about sort of his, his view that it, it only speaks of burdens and then silent about the opportunities that new technologies make possible. Um, and that his dissenting voice is sometimes just needed to moderate sort of the enthusiasm that's, that's gonna happen. But it was not some, his, that sort of skepticism was um, evident in some of our participants that, um, that for tribal communities, for some of, the, some of the ones, our participants who were very reticent to engage in the process, that for them, um, they wanted to know how does how does this how does tech benefit us? And so, um, for me, that's been a huge, I think, key to all my work is trying to understand and work with communities to answer that that huge question: does how does tech benefit our communities? Because we've given everything away, we've done everything. And still it hasn't, we gave, we put our kids in boarding schools, we've learned English, we've done, we've done everything, yet it's still not benefited us. How is, gonna, how is this tech and all these amazing projects gonna do that? And I think by following the, the librarians, those that are community members who are embedded there, who, who actually know how their communities work, I think they're gonna be the people to lead us in terms of the work that I do with the Peabody Essex Museum and, and helping kind of to bring up a new generation of museum, libraries and archives professionals, a lot of what I do is really teach about listening, about stopping and asking questions on both sides, of learning and again managing those expectations of how you're going into it. What, do, what does everybody want? And I do this with my fellows before they even come. What, what does uh, what does a successful fellowship feel like at the end of 10 weeks? And I think that these are the sort of lessons for me that I've learned and in terms of outside community and working with History Pen and StoryCorps, for them it's been listening because there's such an excitement to go in and do things on this shortened time schedule. For them, um, I think that the, the most important thing I think that you can take out of this is that it's really important to think about um, sort of to, to strip away what you want to teach tribal communities and really give them the opportunity to teach you and learn from them. Because I think for them, they have a lot of the solutions there in their communities. It's just a matter of listening and helping to empower them to make the choices um, for for the better of for the better of them and themselves and the communities that they work for